Hey everybody, uh, my name is Rob Galvin. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I am very excited to be your host for today's session in a uh, new series that we have dedicated just for developers. It's called Dev Talks, and this is our first edition. Um, and actually, you know, we announced this a few weeks ago. We weren't quite sure what uh, we would expect. Right? We weren't sure. If if you would have the time for this, we weren't sure if the, this concept was even uh, important. And we were uh, actually pleasantly surprised. We had close to 400 developers uh, sign up to be notified that we were actually doing these uh, sessions. And for today, we had almost 200 people actually register. So it looks like we have a good crowd. Uh, so thanks for letting us know that um, these dev talks are important to you. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to attend today. And before we jump into the topic for today, since this is our first session, I really just wanted to spend a few moments just talking about some of the uh, things that you can expect from attending these sessions. All right, so this is a developer talk. Uh, obviously, we will be talking all about developer-related topics. So you'll see you know, a lot of code. You'll see a lot of walkthroughs. You'll see... Uh, us demonstrating concepts and tools that will help make your life easier. Um, anything to do with developers. Um, this, you know, particularly around our product SDKs, we'll spend a lot of time, but also it could be third-party uh, SDKs that we work with. It could be general uh, you know, topics or, or developer-related um, things that are going on in the industry that we, that we need to cover. So it's really anything about developers. Okay. What we will not cover a little delay with the slides. Sorry about that. So what we'll not cover is this is this session will have no selling, no marketing. Uh, we're not going to um, try to sell you any of our products. This is really just for developer-related uh, topics. In fact, for today, we didn't even invite the product manager on some of these uh, sessions that uh, some of the topics that we're that we're talking about. So this is really about uh, developers. Um, also, you know, we're looking to. Um, present topics that are fresh, right? We're not looking to represent things that you may have heard many different times um, about our strategy and, and things like that. We only have, you know, 12 or so a year that we're going to cover, so we want to make sure that the important topics bubble up to the top. And most importantly, um, this session is, is really about you, okay? Um, it's about you as a developer and, um, you know, what is important to you. So that's why we ask you when you join, uh, when you register, to let us know uh, about the topics that you'd like to hear. Um, we are really going to be driven by the community on the, the presentations and the sessions that we cover. Um, in fact, we didn't even pick a session for next month. Okay, So it's really important that you give us that feedback to make sure that since we are only doing so, you know, uh, so many of these, that, that we cover the most important topics. Okay, So please let us know when you leave the session today. Let us know what you want to hear. Uh, when you're online in our uh, developer community, let us know as well, and we'll be sure to cover the topics that are important. So a few, a few housekeeping notes before we jump into today's uh, topic. So first of all, we have a, a space on our developer community that's dedicated just for these developer events. So this is where you will see one place to go to for all of our events. Uh, we'll start putting in some physical events that will be attending there here as well. But for these dev talks, this is where we'll, we will be posting new dev talks, um, what the topics will be, how you can register for them. Um, after the presentation, we'll put the recording here as well. And we ask you to please carry on the conversation, even after today's session. If you have other questions about what we covered today, um, it'll be there. Okay. And in the unfortunate event that you have to leave uh, this exciting topic today, uh, the recording will be here as well. So we are recording this session and we'll post it here to the developer events uh, page. If you haven't signed up for the notifications, um, you can do so right there on the page um, as well, and, and you'll be notified when we do new developer talks, and we won't spam you. We'll just we'll send you a casual reminder a few weeks before the session uh, that's coming up. Okay. So before we get into the topic today, let me just introduce today's topic. Um, today. We're, talk, we're here to talk about Xamarin, okay? We have uh, several SDKs that are available. Uh, some are available now, some are available, will be available soon. So in today's session, we're going to basically cover the solutions that we have for Xamarin, the Xamarin platform. 
we know a lot of you are, you know, come from the .NET background, and we know that you want to continue to use your skills um, and build applications for our devices. So we know Xamarin and C Sharp and, and .NET uh, programming is important. Okay, we're going to cover both the printer side and the enterprise device side um, for our Xamarin SDKs. And basically, what we're going to do is going to walk you through making sure you're up and running with them, that you're set up with them. You understand the APIs that you need to use to um, build your applications, okay? And although, you know, we know how entertaining it is for you to watch somebody else code, um, what we decided to do today was, because we have a lot to cover, is basically show you a lot of the code and the concepts, uh, but it's not going to be a follow-along. It's not going to be uh, something where you need to, um, you know, code as we go. We'll have some of those sessions in the future, but today we're, we want to make sure that you have uh, the constructs for building um, applications using our SDKs. We do have a lot of uh, tutorials and samples online where you can actually walk through the, the process, okay? So that's what we're going to cover today. And let me just introduce the presenters. Uh, so today's fascinating presenters, we have two speakers. We have uh, Bill Hecox from the enterprise side. He's responsible for our developer community and documentation for uh, enterprise. And then Quagliana, who's the ISC and engineering manager for the printer SDKs. So, Dan and Bill, welcome. Dan, I'm going to actually turn it over to you now. All right. Thanks a lot, Rob. Really appreciate that introduction. Uh, so, again, thanks, everyone, for joining. My name is Dan Qualiana. I work with ISVs, as Rob said, on the printer side of Zebra's business. And to kick things off, we, we picked this Xamarin topic because uh, the Xamarin Evolve show is coming up next month, and Zebra is going to be a silver sponsor there. And we really wanted to let you all know that you know, we really do value this partnership with Xamarin. And also, you know, we, we have a lot of developers currently working on Xamarin. And as Rob said, as developers you know, work with, have worked with some legacy Zebra products, C-sharp developers, they're now transitioning to other operating systems. Xamarin's been a really good opportunity, a good platform for them to be able to, uh, to move their apps forward. So if you guys are planning on going to the event, we would love to meet you in person. Um, so attending the show will be myself and Bill, who's presenting today. And then uh, we also have Robin West, who's going to be, who is the, the main developer of the Link OS Xamarin SDK that I'll be going through. She'll be there. Uh, and we have some other resources um, on the enterprise side of business, too. So we'd love to see you there. Please stop by our booth if, you're, if you attend. So I'm going to I'm going to dive into the this new upcoming Xamarin SDK uh, that's for the Link OS framework. Um, so first and foremost, when we look at um, how people interface with the printers, we wanted to identify with Xamarin what are the big operating systems, what's the main usage of how people would use this. So based on that, what we decided to do was to build a portable plugin. So that's a type of component uh, plugin allows you to create either Android or iOS or to do a forms app. A forms app is one where you write it once and then you can deploy across both Android and iOS. Um, and the way that we did this, we, we tried to make it so it would work with as many Zebra printers as possible. And so this will go across the Link OS line which is the newest printing line, which covers you know, all of the mobile printers right now, um, a good portion of the desktop and industrial printers as well. But then we also have support for ZebraLink, which is the legacy printers. So there's a few printers that, that, that don't fall into this category. There are some kiosk printers um, and a few kind of exceptions, but really this is kind of 99% of the printer portfolio Zebra has. Um, you know, another thing to that we wanted to point out here, Zebra's printer SDK philosophy had been to create a multi-platform SDK, which meant we were we know that people write apps across multiple devices, and so we tried to have the APIs as similar and common across those platforms as possible, and so that allowed um, this project to work with Xamarin to actually do true cross-platform development. It made it much easier. And so what we were able to do was that all the common functions we had between our Windows Mobile, which was our base C-sharp SDK, iOS and Android, we've rolled into this Xamarin SDK. So there are a couple 
uh, features in our Android SDK that were more advanced that we didn't have across the others, and those aren't in this, but they're really much more advanced functionality. So the basics of what you want to do, and, and even some advanced features, are, are rolled over here. Um, you know, so the last thing here is this is not released yet. Uh, we're targeting mid-April, so we will have this released before we hit that Xamarin uh, Evolve event. If you don't want to wait the extra month and you want to get access to this, you can go onto Launchpad or you can email us at the email that's up there, isv underscore nala underscore support at zebra.com. But I'm going to show you guys on Launchpad, developer.zebra.com. You know, Rob mentioned this with our developer events section, uh, but this is where we try to drive and build our developer community. So if you want access to this SDK or just to get other information, please go here. Um, I'm now showing one of the printing pages. This is our label and receipt page. And you can see there's a, a button here, sign up for beta releases. Just send us a note there. We can work with you to get you access. There's also, you know, we frequently update blogs and and answer the discussion questions here, and there's links to getting started and API documentation. So that's just a little plug. Uh, we do want you to go there. We, we try to make that your one-stop shop. Um, so in terms of the Xamarin SDK, there's a few things you need to make sure you have on your system. Visual Studio is the base platform that Xamarin wants to build off of, so make sure you have that. Then you need to have Xamarin, and to be able to compile, you need a license. Uh, and then lastly, NuGet, which comes with Visual Studio, but we want to make sure we call that out because that's how you're able to pull in um, the, uh, the Zebra Link OS plugin. Uh, so before we really dive into the code, I wanted to point out a few things that we're really trying to promote around best practices when you're making a printing application. Um, so my team, you know, we, we have been engaging with software developers for more than the last six years, and we've seen a lot of common issues and a lot of uh, best practices of how we recommend people building their applications out. So we really want to make sure we share these with everyone. Um, so, you know, one of the first things is, you know, when a customer gets a new printer, they want it to work with your application immediately. So if there's a whole bunch of settings or you want people to do different setup things, see how much of that you can pull into your application so that that can just be done programmatically and it makes it so customers who don't always have as much knowledge about the products, so they don't have to do that. Um, we also recommend when you're doing testing, you know, look at some really common error cases, like when the printer's unreachable, so it's either not connected or it's off, when the printer's in some error cases, like it's out of media or the media door is open, just to see what kind of behavior you're getting back. And then to kind of add on to that, it's really nice to for you to show the user of your application when, whether that printer is available and if it's in those error states. So that's doing statusing. And we're going to go through some of the code on how to do that. We've seen from both developers and from customers uh, that this has huge value. So from the developer perspective, by putting that status in, you're really able to differentiate your application and you're able to provide more value to that customer as they're trying to improve their processes and drive efficiency. That's another thing. Because customers, if they, if they try to print and it doesn't come out, they want to know why and what's going on. Um, one other one is checking the printer formatting language. So Link OS is our common operating system we have across the products. And so all Link OS products can accept the ZPL language, but that doesn't mean that all of our printers come in a mode that's the ZPL by default. So if you're writing an app that's going to interface with multiple printers, we really recommend checking what language that printer is in first and setting the language. And that's another thing. You can do that programmatically. We have the code here. We're going to go through showing you how to do that. Um, and, you know, so those are the key, the key things I really wanted to highlight there. And so now we're going to go through, um, rather than just show some APIs, I thought it would be best to really show you the guts of when you're actually building an app that can print, what are the 
the main components of that, and then we're going to walk through the code of how to actually do this. Um, so right here, we kind of have 10 steps of what we do through this printing process, but we really summarize it in the communication. How do you find what printer you want to connect to, and then how do you actually establish that connection? Um, how do you verify the settings and the actual format? So when we say format, that's the layout of what you want your printed output to look like. How do you establish that? Um, making sure that the, the data you want to print is being um, put into your code and sent down to the printer properly. Um, and then we're, we're actually going to go through a method that we call template-based printing. Um, and so I'm going to touch on that a little as we're going through. But that's an optimized way to do printing. Um, so you can see these are the core components of what we're, what we're going to be covering. So one big caveat here, when we're working with Xamarin, if you are deploying across these different operating systems, you really need to make sure that this essentially ends up being a native application. And so there's different OS-specific things you need to make sure that you account for. And Bluetooth is one that really has a few things you need to highlight. So you know, as we've written here, um, the Android manifest needs to be updated. Apple, when you're dealing with Bluetooth, is um, can be a little trickier. There's a made for iPhone uh, requirement for establishing a Bluetooth connection. The majority of Zebra's LinkOS products are made for iPhone, uh, but there's also rules. So you have to, um, you must pair that printer in the iOS settings first. Um, you can't do all of this programmatically in your application. And unfortunately, that, that's an Apple restriction, but that's something as you're building these apps out across the operating systems, make sure you're aware of some of those differences and how your users need to, uh, need to interface. So first, we're going to dive in printer discovery. How do you know what is available and establishing that connection? So the discovery is finding what is on the network. And we're going to focus on uh, network uh, discovery here rather than Bluetooth, because as I pointed out on the previous slide, there are some differences with Bluetooth. Um, but we will, within our SDK, have developer demos that show both network and Bluetooth. So really what we're trying to do here in our network discovery is, in the first section here, we're really establishing a few variables so that we can identify what types of status we're seeing as we're doing this discovery. Is there an error? Um, have, have we finished? Have we found the printers yet? And so that's what our first section is doing. Then we're actually running this. Um, so you see the next section we're going through, we're identifying you know, what the discovered printer is. And, um, and then if we see errors, we're making sure those are brought back so that the user can see that. Next, we need to make sure that we actually connect to the printer. And because we're just kind of going through a limited amount of code here, we haven't done this, but we do want to make sure that you're doing any of this connection on a separate thread. Uh, that way it doesn't impact the performance of the rest of the application. Also, we mentioned before, um, whether you're a, if the printer is unreachable, we don't want that because the printer is a peripheral device, we don't want that to be really impacting the performance of the app. So this is pretty, pretty basic here, what we're doing, but we're identifying the printer that we found in the discovery. Um, we did think it's important to point out here, though, that uh, this is not the only way to do a connection. Um, discovery is a nice way to find what's available, but you also can write code where you would really just be directly connecting to a printer. And so that we have that code there at the bottom so that you can, if you know that MAC address or serial number or IP address, you can just put that address directly in and, and do that connection directly. So next here, we're doing this check and setting printer language. So this is one I talked about in the best practices. Um, and you know, I didn't say this before, but you know, part of the reason we see a lot of value in doing this is that we last year evaluated over 
a hundred applications, doing testing on them, and this was an issue that came up 55% of the time that people failed this test because they were trying to work with printers that had different default languages and that out-of-the-box test failed so they wouldn't actually print uh, if they had the wrong language. So this is something, you know, as I said before, we really do strongly recommend this. So a, a key piece to note here of what we're doing, um, you know, in this first line we're writing, uh, but what you'll notice here we're doing a, a specific command that we have called a set var. This is part of a command set that we have. We call them our set get do commands. We have over 700 of these that really let you control most every component within the printer. So this specific one is around device languages. But you really can use these write commands to focus on any of the set and the get commands. So this it's really something We've opened up the printer, so you have access to all these settings. So what we're doing here is we're setting the language to ZPL, and then next we're getting the value. Uh, you see that there's a get var, and that's to verify that the change actually went through. And then at the bottom, what we're doing is we're doing a check, and so this is not actually um, this error is not necessarily saying that the language wasn't set, but it's saying that um, any Link OS or ZebraLink printer should be able to be set. Um, and so this is another way we can check that you, know, you could potentially be working with a printer that doesn't have that capability to even work with this SDK. Um, so that was just a, a way that we built out to verify that. So the next thing what, that we're going to do is we're going to focus on some of the actual printing here. And so I wanted to point one thing out to you, which is a, a method that we call template-based printing. So I have the print format. So this is the ZPL, Zebra Printing Language, that's sent to the printer to do the printing. And what we're doing here is we're actually making a template. So if you look at the printed label here, the way we have this set up is the word visitor will always print. So that's, we'll call that static text. And then we have two field boxes, the zebra and technologies, that we'll call dynamic. And so this is really, it's a variable that's in our ZPL. And then what we're doing is we're taking this and we're actually going to store it on the printer on the E drive. And what this allows us to do is that when, you, in many of our customers' use cases, we have these common labeled templates. And so rather than having to send everything down, you can just send the variable text. Um, so what we see is if you're printing a shipping label, say, and you're going to have probably 80% of your labels the same every time, but you're changing the recipient, so a name, an address, and a barcode, you can just send that dynamic data, and it saves you time, bandwidth, and it's more efficient. Another thing you can also do is if you have an image that you're printing on your label, you can store that on the printer as well, and that's where you can really see some throughput increases by not having to send that image. And you can recall that in just the same way we're going to go through uh, here with this label. So that's kind of the overview of template-based printing. What we're doing in this code is we're assuming that this label format has already been sent to the printer. It's sitting on the printer. And now in our code, what we're doing is we are retrieving that format from the printer so that we can understand what they have and what these fields are. So you can see we're retrieving the format from the printer. We're calling it uh, based on the drive and the file name. Um, and then in our, our next step, what we're going to do is we're actually going to be prompting the user to fill in this dynamic data. So sometimes this is something maybe you'll have a scanner set up where you're scanning this data and it will fill it in. Um, you may not actually always have this where the user is inputting it. This may be something it's, you're tied into a back-end system, an ERP system, or something like that, some kind of database, and you can, you can automatically fill that. Um, but we do see a lot of scanning applications where people will kind of scan information and fill it in these forms. So all we're doing here is we're identifying what are the fields, what is the data that's going to go in there, and then we have this the UI to reflect what we're doing there. 
Um, we also talked about status checking and the value for that. So status checking is something we build into the APIs. So we really try to make this as simple as possible. Um, you know, we just have a function for current status, and then we have the alert where we can just fill in, um, you know, what the, the actual status is. Here, we're, we're only doing this if the printer is not ready to print. So lastly, um, what we're going to do is we're actually sending our print job down. So what we're doing here is we are um, we're taking that dynamic information that we entered previously, the zebra and technologies, those two fields, and we are um, telling the printer to recall the stored format and to print it and fill in uh, with those fields that we put in before. And ultimately, that is going to actually trigger the, the print event, and you'll get your printed label based on that. So this next section is something that, um, you know, we wouldn't require this, but we do recommend, you know, a lot of people, um, the printing can be a critical part of their business operations, and so they really want to verify uh, whether the printing actually occurred. And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to look, did the printer run into any errors as it was going through this process of printing? So we're going to be checking the status. We're going to you know, give it time to make sure that it's actually printing, uh, that we're running through the buffer, and then we're telling people, did any errors actually come up? And so then they can know whether that print job actually went through. So this next slide, all this is doing is outside of the discovery section that we did at the beginning of trying to find the printers on the network, it's pulled everything together so you can see how it all lays together. So really, this isn't very much code at all. So you can see, you know, what we're trying to show you guys is even doing some of the things that we would term advanced and that show a lot of value uh, to your customers, it's still very easy to implement within the code. Um, and this is functionality that we are building developer demos that are part of our SDK. Um, and we do know that you know, a lot of you really just look at us for how to do these best practices and take things as is. So that's what we're trying to do here, just show uh, exactly how to do the core functionality of working with a Zebra printer. So that's the, uh, that's the end of my section on the printing. So, you know, thanks, you guys, for your time. I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Bill right now. So let me make sure I can uh, get this working right. I'm going to make yeah. Bill the presenter. Uh, just a moment, Dan. Let me... Uh... Right, so yeah, my name is Bill Heacock. So today I'm going to walk you through uh, the Xamarin uh, MDK for Xamarin. Uh, you know, what is the MDK for Xamarin? It's um, a set of tools that uh, allow you to build um, applications that will configure Zebra's uh, Android devices or, uh, or build uh, uh, barcode scanning applications, make use of Zebra's barcode scanning hardware. It's designed to work with Visual Studio and Xamarin Studio. Um, along with the component, we include a graphic user interface called uh, Profile Manager that allows you to build XML-based profiles uh, that you can submit to the device for configuration. Um, and to ease the install of these tools, uh, we've created IDE extensions uh, for both uh, uh, all the way back to Visual Studio 2013 and uh, Xamarin Studio 594, I believe. Um, you know, to get started with the, the MDK, uh, we need to install one of those extensions for either one of the IDEs. Uh, you know, one, once installed, um, you, you'll be presented with a new uh, a new MDK uh, uh, library, or I'm sorry, new MDK menu option uh, to allow you to install the component. Um, you know, once we've got uh, the component installed, of course, then you could open up a an existing uh, Xamarin Android project or create a new one. Um, 
and then uh, add that, e uh, that EMDK component to your project. And lastly, uh, the last setup step you would need to do is uh, you know, modify your, uh, your manifest, make some changes to your manifest. And so to walk through those setup steps, you know, quickly uh, in, in Visual Studio, uh, you would need to go to, to Tools, um, uh, Extensions and Updates, uh, select the Online section, and then uh, the Visual Studio Gallery, uh, search for the MDK, and once the MDK is found, just click the Download button and follow the on-screen instructions. Similarly for Xamarin Studio, uh, you would launch the Add-in Manager um, and uh, go to the Gallery tab and select IDE Extensions and search for EMDK. And as well, select the EMDK once it's found and click the Install button and follow the on-screen instructions. At that point, uh, after install, uh, you're, again, you're presented with an EMDK menu. Uh, the, the MDK menu uh, gets all these tools at your fingertips here to where you could uh, launch our profile manager, which again is a, is a graphic user interface that allows you to build profiles and fill out form fields uh, to you know, do things such as uh, setting the, uh, the date and time on, on a device or building a Wi-Fi profile or turning the Bluetooth uh, radios on and off. Um, a very powerful tool. Um, the, the output of that profile manager is an XML file that you would then submit to the device for, uh, for processing. Um, in, in this menu, we, we give you uh, the, the added uh, tool to install the component on your device, uh, and this, the, or I'm sorry, on your uh, development system. Uh, this makes it available uh, to the IDE later on to add to your project. Um, one other piece of DMDK is a, is a device runtime, and this is installed on all uh, uh, recent uh, and uh, Zebra devices, Zebra Android devices, uh, but it may require, depending on the version you're running, um, uh, the version that's on the device that may need to be updated. So we uh, give you a command here in the menu to update that runtime. We also give you quick uh, access to our documentation um, and our, our uh, developer community launchpad, and uh, quick access to our uh, sample projects that, uh, in a uh, GitHub repo. Um, again, from this menu, we'll, we'll, we can add uh, the, the component to our, our system. And then once that uh, component's added to our system, again, we can either create an Android project, a Xamarin Android project, or, or open one you already have built. Um, and then, uh, you know, once our project's open, uh, in our Solution Explorer, sorry about that, in our Solution Explorer, uh, we can uh, right-click on our Components uh, uh, folder and select Edit Components. And then uh, so once, the, once the resulting screen will pop up and ask um, or show a list of all the components uh, installed on your machine and allow you to add these to your, pro add these to your project. So again, just click Add Project, Add Project to uh, incorporate it in. You know, one of the, 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 man in the Android manifest, you'll need to make sure and, and uh, request access to, the, to use the EMDK and permission to use the EMDK and tell Android that you want to make use of the EMDK library uh, that's, in, that's installed on the device. Now for, for, the, uh, for EMDK usage, um, you know, the, the, uh, you've got about six steps here. Um, uh, the, the main thing is that to start off with is to incorporate, uh, add reference to the EMDK library. Um, we want to uh, request an EMDK manager object, and this EMDK manager object is going to give us access to uh, the lower level APIs, so barcode manager and profile manager, uh, which are the, the two IP APIs we expose in, in, in the uh, EMDK for Xamarin. Um, one, once we have an EMDK manager object, uh, we can start making use of those, of those uh, APIs, and uh, there are a few things that we need to make sure we do uh, because this is an Android application, we need to make sure that we deal with these, these objects properly in our Android lifecycle methods, our onDestroy, our onCreate, onPause. Uh, so w when you add the Xamarin component to your project, it will automatically add reference to the MDK libraries for you. Uh, you can see that in your reference section in, in, in Solution Explorer. But you'll also need to add the using directives to, to make use of the uh, libraries you're going to use. Now, if you're not going to use barcoding in, in your application, you're only going to use Profile Manager or one of those that are exposed, uh, Version Manager, for instance, um, you only need to make reference to, to Xamarin EMDK. Um, to step <clears throat> right into the code here, um, 
this is no, normally, you know, we, we suggest you do this in your own create. Um, the first thing we're going to do is ask for an EMDK manager object. Um, again, this is going to give us access to uh, the profile manager and, uh, and, and barcode manager. You'll notice here when we, we call this, this method, get EMDK manager, we're passing in our application context and our activity context. Um, and you'll notice that it doesn't actually return us an EMDK manager object. It's returning us this results, EMDK results. Um, this is happening again in our on create, and we don't want to block for any any large period of time in fear of getting an application not responding uh, message to the user. So um, what we do is block for a short period of time, uh, request the MDK manager, and what's happening in the background asynchronously is we're uh, you know, we're binding to the MDK service, and it will um, asynchronously give us an MDK object um, uh, via via a a listener interface. Um, but with this call, with this results object, it's going to tell us right away that if, if the request for that, that EMDK object was successful or not, that way we can go inspect that, uh, the status codes and, and alert the user whether there was an issue or not. And so again, uh, our, our EMDK manager object is going to come back as uh, asynchronously through this listener interface. So what we'll need to do is implement this EMDK manager, EMDK listener uh, interface. Um, and uh, implement its on open and on closed methods. Um, you'll notice here that uh, I cre this is a, a global that I created at the top of my my project, uh, so that it's accessible from everywhere in, in the in the uh, in the activity. And uh, we'll notice that when when the EMDK listener uh, on open fires, it passes us that EMDK manager object. That tells us that the EMDK uh, is ready for use, and and we can. Uh, start making use of it in our in our code. Uh, so the first thing I've done here is is uh, set our global EMDK manager to the instance that was passed. And then uh, in our only closed method, uh, we'll want to make sure. So this this might happen if, if something goes wrong with the EMDK service in the background and for some reason has to close. Uh, this this method will fire and this allows gives us the the ability to clean up any references we have, release any any resources we've made and clean up that, that, uh, that object. So now that we've got an, an EMDK manager object, uh, we can ask uh, the EMDK manager for an instance of a, a profile manager. Uh, again, I've created a global at the top of our activity. Um, here we're asking, uh, asking EMDK manager to give us an instance of feature type profile. And then what, what it will return an EMDK base object and we need to cast that to a profile manager object and set that as set our global with that. Now that we've got a profile manager object, um, you know, we I'm not going to go into, into showing the, the profile manager here, but uh, the profile manager graphic interface will again allow you to build those those tools, uh, I'm sorry, those profiles. They're XML profiles that it will exist in your access, I'm sorry, your um, assets folder uh, once it's built. Um, you would give that pro, uh, that profile a name, and uh, it's caught in, in, in all of our samples. We uh, name that or, or make a global and, and, and call profile name that has the name of that profile that we're wanting to pass. And in this case, we're going to call the profile manager's process profile uh, method, uh, passing in that that profile name, and then. Uh, as a result, again, we're going to use the MDK results object, and, and once it's submitted and this returns, we're able to inspect that results uh, status code to see whether we successfully um, uh, sent the profile and processed it. Um, now, as far as, far as um, passing profiles goes, you're rarely going to get the success unless you're on, I mean, the only reason you're going to get the success uh, is when we're using our, the data capture uh, sections of uh, Profile Manager, basically configuring a uh, data wedge through a profile. Um, most other pro uh, profile features, uh, will, uh, almost all of the profile features will return a check XML um, because it's using uh, our, our, our value add MX um, tools to, to configure the device. So um, this check XML is basically going to, the results object will also have a result string that will allow you to inspect uh, XML uh, for any errors and uh, be able to, to tell whether your, your uh, process submission was, uh, was successful. 
So one of the last things you need to do with, with Profile Manager is make sure in our on destroy uh, that we clean up any references to it. Uh, make sure that we null out our Profile Manager object, release our EMDK uh, resources, and null out our EMDK manager as well. For Barcode Manager, in a similar fashion, I've created a, a global variable. And again, I'm asking um, the MDK manager for an instance um, instance of a, a barcode object, this, in this case, feature type barcode. The MDK base is returned, so I'm going to cast it to a barcode manager object and set our global. And so now that we've got a barcode manager object, we can actually ask it for access to our, our scanner hardware. In this case, I'm going to run the barcode manager get device method. Uh, passing in a device identifier, uh, and, and in this case, I'm going to use the, the default, and that would be, um, if I ask barcode manager device identifier, identifier default, I'm going to ask for uh, whatever's default on that device. For instance, maybe a, a TC55 with an imager built in, uh, it's going to give me that as opposed to, say, the camera. Um, in this case, we could also pass dot .camera here, and it would give us the camera as our, as our scanner. Um, Couple of things that we need to wire up some events here um, to get our scanner data back. When uh, once we once we scan, uh, we'll need to wire up an event and and, and handle that event. Uh, uh, in this case, we're calling it scanner data, uh, the the event handler, and uh, through the event args, it will pass our scanner information, a, a collection of scanner information, back so that we can pick out our uh, scanner data and, and present it to the user or process process it some other way. Uh, similarly, we're going to want to know uh, kind of what state the, the scanner is in to either present to the user that we're, we're idle or that we're scanning, or if we want to make uh, if and else decisions upon, uh, upon that, whether we want to start a new scan, for instance, if we're doing it via software instead of a hardware trigger. So now we've got a scanner. We've got some events wired up so we can get our data back. Now we can actually start using uh, that scanner. Uh, first, we're going to need to enable the scanner. And then once it's enabled, we can pull, and, and uh, this allows us to then pull out uh, the scanner's config, modify the con scanner's configuration uh, options. Um, for this case, we're in, in, in enabling the EAN8 uh, decoder parameters. And then once we have uh, modified our scanner config object, we can set the scanner's uh, config back to what we've modified. And then uh, with the scanner, we can also set its trigger type. Uh, whether we want to actually use the hardware buttons on the side of the, the Android device or if we want to do this via software, uh, we set it to, to uh, uh, soft scan and then we can call uh, scanner read and in both of these cases where the hardware or software will get our information back through that uh, scanner data event. So now we, uh, in order for us to clean up uh, in order for it to deinitialize de the scanner when we're done with it, of course, we're going to want to, uh, and this would happen, of course, in our uh, on pause or, or on destroy, uh, we're going to want to cancel any pending reads, um, disable the scanner, uh, unhook all these event handlers, and release the scanner. You know, you would want, again, you would want to do that um, in our on pause and on resume. You know, in the case of the barcode manager, uh, as opposed to Profile Manager. Profile Manager, we're basically just going to clean up any references to it when, when our application is destroyed. Someone hits the back button, for instance. Um, in this case, for, for Barcode Manager, we're going to make, want to make sure that um, uh, we release any of the barcode resources, the scanner, uh, so that if your application pauses and goes to the background and another application comes to the foreground that also wants to use Barcode Manager, uh, that we aren't tying up the scanner resources in our application still. So again, and on pause, just a quick, quick uh, high-level overview. We're going to deinitialize the scanner. We're going to null out the barcode manager, and release any resources. And when our application resumes and comes back to the foreground, we're going to basically going to rebuild our barcode manager instance uh, by requesting uh, the barcode manager instance again and reinitializing the scanner. And again, in our undestroy, uh, we'll want to do similar to to profile manager is clean up. Uh, any references to uh, clean up our, our barcode manager reference and release any any uh, any resources the MDK manager has. A couple of uh, gotchas to point out uh, with the the Xamarin component. Um, with the Xamarin component, we 
the barcode uh, sample. Um, when you include the component in your project, for instance, um, and, and you're looking through the component to, to kind of read about what it, what, in, in the getting started document, read about what it can do, there you can also launch uh, that sample uh, directly from uh, the components page. Um, what, what I found is that when you, when you launch it from there, um, most times on Windows, you get a path too long exception. Uh, um, uh, the reason being is that it, depending on where your project's stored, likely in your, your profile, uh, uh, in, your, in your profile, in your, in your uh, uh, project folder, inside the Visual Studio folder, um, it copies the whole uh, component into your project as well as that, the, the barcode manager sample. Uh, so it, it's too far away from the root of your hard drive, so the, the quickest way to fix that is to go ahead and grab that uh, sample project folder out of, uh, out of the component and move it closer to the root of your hard drive, whether into the, directly, uh, into the root of C or not, um, and then the, pro the sample should run uh, correctly. Uh, or you can just pull down that sample directly from our GitHub repository and run it from wherever you placed it on your system. Uh, one other thing to point out is that uh, if, if you are uh, upgrading from, say, uh, 1.0 to the new upcoming 2.0 Xamarin, uh, uh, MDK for Xamarin, uh, when, when you change versions or you remove a, uh, the MDK, I'm sorry, a Xamarin component uh, via Solution Explorer, it doesn't delete it from your project. So uh, you'll, you'll need to go in and physically remove that from, uh, from the folder structure in your project. You know, so to learn more about, uh, about the MDK for Xamarin, um, of course, you can always go to Launchpad here, but we've also got uh, our technical documentation on the MDK for Xamarin and, Xamarin and uh, uh, MDK for Android at techdocs.zebra.com. And with that, I'll pass it back to Rob Galvin. All right. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. And thanks, Dan, for uh, presenting. So we reached the end of the webinar, but we're not done yet. Um, so first of all, thanks for, uh, uh, for attending. And before we get to some of the questions, I just wanted to find out uh, what you'd like to hear uh, next time. So if you can kindly, and this is a part of a, where I see who's actually still with us um, at the end of the session. So sometimes in the future, maybe we'll get a prize or not for sticking around at the end. But anyway, uh, we'd like to see what you would like to hear next time. Next time is probably about a month from now. Uh, so like I said before, we're looking to do these once a month. And, we're, you know, we're looking for feedback again, like I mentioned before. Do you want to see us do something more deeper on MDK uh, for Xamarin or Android, uh, a feature deep dive, you know, specifically going through uh, follow along? code example. Um, do you want to see us do something more about printer SDKs and some of the different ways you can use the different uh, APIs? Uh, what about enterprise browser? You know, are you developing enterprise browser applications? Do you want to know how to how to learn about how to um, deliver the best performing type of enterprise browser application that you can? Uh, another kind of concept that we had was, uh, I call them rapid fire do's and don'ts. So this is more of a, you know, we're going to pick an area, maybe across different products and give you some of the things that we've seen come into support and don't do this and do this instead type of scenarios. And then there could be other things that are outside of our scope, which are more general. I say general in terms of, you know, what's happening in, in the field. What are some of the things that uh, we need to consider when building an application? Uh, one of them I put out there, I've been looking a lot at recently, is uh, real-time databases. Uh, so if you have data, which we all do in our applications, um, instead of coming up with a sync engine or a sync solution, how can you use some of these real-time database services instead uh, to give you uh, better performance? So uh, do me a favor and fill out the uh, session. Looks like we have a lot of people still with us and, and uh, responding, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So now let's, uh, let's get to some questions. I'll keep the poll open for a little while. Um, so I guess the, the first question, Dan, are you, are you still there? Let me ask you. Still here, yep. All right. So in the... Um, when you're in the discovery process, you mentioned that uh, you can specify, you know, the, the Bluetooth address or the network address. I guess another possible best practice would be to maybe even do pair EMDK with the printer SDKs and scan a barcode, right, that has that information on there, and then you can, init you know, initiate the, the connection right away. Uh, do you see that being used uh, out in the field? We definitely see that being used. Uh, the discovery process does take some time, 
And so if you know the device that you're working with, we actually see some people, um, you know, on the bottom of the printer, we usually will have a Bluetooth um, information that you can scan. So you, we see a lot of people do that. That's really one of the quickest ways to do it. Another method that you can use is, actually, is something we call print touch. There is a passive NFC tag in the printer that contains the MAC addresses. And so you can write code and pull in, uh, kind of parse through the, all the data that's in that NFC tag, and you can get that MAC address and you can use that through the uh, that alternate method as well, since you already know that address. So we, we definitely see that used a lot of different ways. Um, we didn't highlight that as much here just because we were doing more network-based, and I think, you know, m more often, Bluetooth, someone will know the address or they will be doing scanning to fill that in. On the network side, we do see people use discovery a little more often. Okay, great. Um, Bill, question for you. Um, yeah. Does the EMDK work with the Mac version of Xamarin Studio? Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, we support both. Um, install method is similar. Um, the the place where the MDK or the add-in manager is is different, um, whether you're in Windows or or, um, or Mac. Uh, for for Mac, it's it's actually clicking the the uh, Xamarin, I'm sorry, Xamarin Studio um, on the on the me, on the bar. Uh, in in Windows, you're just clicking Tools to get to add-in manager. But similar process, the add-in manager the layout is exactly the same on both, and uh, access to all of those features are exactly the same. Okay. Uh, another question for you, Bill. So, when you were talking about the component installation, so the first step was install the gallery extension, and then I needed to install the component. Do I need to install a component every time I build a project, or can you just clarify that a bit? Yes. Yes. For for the project, you'll need to. So, the, when you create your project and you include the you include the component, you'll need to do that for every project. But adding the Component from the EMDK menu is only only has to be done once. And for so, for instance, if you if you have um, EMD, uh, you're running both Xamarin Studio and Visual Studio on a Windows machine. Um, if you were to install the component from from Xamarin Studio onto your system, onto the onto the the development system, and you were to open a Visual Studio, you would also see that component. It would be system wide that that, that component's installed. Uh, but yes, each time you create a project and you want to use the MDK, you'll need to make uh, or, import, or include the component to that project. So, Rob, I wanted to add something in real quick here. You, Bill did a real nice job going through uh, that that install process and the setup, and I didn't cover that on the printer side. Uh, just so people know. Uh, there will be a README file that has step-by-step -step instructions with screenshots showing how to do that process uh, for the printer side. So um, didn't do it today, but we'll have that documented for you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. All right. Let me look at the other questions here. So another question just came in. Um, He's a row mobile developer. Thank you. And uh, should, should I switch to Xamarin? So let me spend a, a minute kind of talking about the, the choices. So row mobile is um, is a cross-platform framework. You're using your web skills to develop your application. So you're using JavaScript, HTML, and you're running in this hybrid container. So enterprise browsers is very similar to that. Um, so it's a, it really boils down to a choice of what programming language do you want to work? Do you want to work in? Uh, do you want to work in, you know, C sharp? Then you're going to use Xamarin. Do you want to use, um, you know, web skills? Then you could possibly use Row Mobile or Enterprise Browser. Um, do you want to, you know, do native Android? We have a solution for you. So um, the goal from Zebra is to provide solutions for all different types of developer personas. We know there's choices uh, with those different ways to build applications. And we're looking to provide solutions for, for all of them that, that are needed. Okay, so it's really just a personal choice. Um, all right. All right. Let's see. Any other questions? All right. So again, um, this session has been recorded. It will be available on our developer community events page. 
and we'll probably have it up either later today or, or tomorrow. We urge you to continue the conversation there. Um, if there's questions that come up after the fact, you've maybe looked at some of the samples and tutorials, um, please feel free to, to add a comment or start a discussion on Launchpad. We'll be looking for those and we'll be responding. And this way the rest of the community can benefit from the discussion as well. And also, like I said, please let us know of the topics you'd like to hear um, in the future. So I'll kind of give one last call for last minute questions. I can't really tell if you're typing or not. So if you are, um, type quickly, Dan, Bill, any other last minute um, comments? No, uh, thank you everyone for a great first dev talk. And we're looking forward to having more of these and connecting more with you both on Launchpad and hopefully at Xamarin Evolve. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. We will see you next time.